As I was closing up for the night, I thought about all the movies that had been discussed in the spoiler room. That was when the temperature in the room changed. I went to the thermostat and it said it was 52 degrees KB. Suddenly I found myself in a maze of movie posters. No matter what direction I went, each path led me back to one actor, Kevin Bacon. That was when it was clear what I had to do. When I snapped out of it, I added bacon to the menu. 2020 was going to be an interesting year in the spoiler room. My God, it's full of bacon. Yes, folks, that's right. 52 degrees at KB all year. That's the temperature here in the spoiler room where we are playing a variation of uh, six degrees to Kevin Bacon, host here, Mark the Movie Man. And uh, you, I dropped it last week. We reviewed Footloose and I was like, we're covering 2010. And how is 2010 connected via the six degrees of Kevin Bacon philosophy? Well, you had John Lithgow. John Lithgow was in Footloose, and he is also in tonight's movie, which is 2010, The Year We Make Contact, or whatever other subtitle you want to put with it. And folks, it is a very special night because returning to the spoiler room, I'm so excited, folks. He is back with us. It is Baby Spice himself, a man <laughs> of much knowledge, the one and only Scotty D. Hello, Scott. Welcome back, sir. It, that's good to be back. It, I haven't been very well lately, <laughs> so it's been almost a year. In fact, uh, w as we're recording this, actually, is a, the one-year anniversary of uh, when I had a surgery done. But, um, yeah, but uh, hopefully I'm going to get back into the game slowly but surely, and I'm uh, happy to be here. Um, Baby Spice is down but not out. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh we're just glad that you're able to make it. It's always fun to talk films, and this is an interesting one to talk about. Uh, you know, when I was coming up with this whole 52 Degrees thing, one, I didn't think I would pull it off, but two, trying to pick interesting movies that we hadn't talked about or that not many people talk about, and there may be some reasons why throughout the year we find out, but 2010, that came out in 1984, uh, actually, well, folks, let me do this because I wanted to do this. I thought about this earlier today. Here we are in 2020 talking about 2010, which came out in 1984. There we go. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to see how many. 2020, which at times, uh, if you if you follow your day to day life, uh, can seem more and more like 1984. <laughs> 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 that <laughs> very very true uh, did you hear that big brother uh so <laughs> tonight we've yeah. always been at war with kevin big yes <laughs> <laughs> so tonight 2010 the sequel to a film that had come out uh quite a bit before then a 1968 2001 a space odyssey that one everybody knows to be the kubrick one and so they came out with this one which was also based off of uh, the book, uh, the book series by Arthur C. Clarke. And Scott, it's been a while. Did you want to try to give the synopsis of 2010? Uh, I can give it a shot. Um, okay, so uh, obviously from the title, it's uh, nine years after the events of 2001, which I'm not going to go into here right now. Um, the uh Everybody's kind of wondering what exactly happened uh, aboard the Discovery because they lost contact with astronaut Dave Bowman just before he entered uh, his pod entered the monolith. Uh, he so in uh, the Arthur C. Clarke's version of the future, uh, the Cold War between the United States and Soviet Union is still going on. In fact, it's heating up, and the Soviets are uh, launching uh, an exploratory team to investigate the discovery, uh, and they're going to make it there before the United States, the way things look. With, but they decide to bring the original uh, person who masterminded the mission, uh, Haywood Floyd, who is played by Roy Scheider, and uh, a couple other uh, U.S. advisors, because... They want to make sure the data means something. They need to find out what's happening. So the, both the U.S. and the Soviets, not, neither of which are completely trusting of one another, uh, go up into space to find out exactly what happened 
to the Discovery. And as they are, they find out that the orbit of the station is changing and something seems to be happening on one of the moons of Jupiter. Something marvelous or whatever he says. Huh? Wonderful. That's right. Something wonderful. (laughs) That's that's said a number of times, almost as many times as with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, (laughs) Yes. um, You know, it's interesting because 2001, of course it's Kubrick, so you know what you're getting there. Them making a uh, sequel to a film that at that point was what... uh, 16 years old no 26 years old <laughs> something like that 16 years old it was like 15 16 yeah, years 15 yeah. so it took a little while <laughs> to get this one made kubrick well, he didn't write the book he didn't write the book sequel until like 82 that's uh, true and i don't think that they were even considering much of a sequel until he wrote the sequel and then all of a sudden holy shit <laughs> Here's a sequel, but Kubrick said he was done with that story. He's done. MGM's Diamond Jubilee, which was in 1984. That's right, it was. Uh, and you, you get that marquee in the beginning, <laughs> the opening. You get the, did that all year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Electric Dreams had it too. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Peter uh, Hyamus. Himes, Himes, thank you. Himes uh, directed this. Uh, he had Kubrick's blessing as well as Arthur C. Clarke's blessing to make it. Kubrick said, "Hey, just make it your own. I'm done with that story because, you know, it's Kubrick." <laughs> so, so you know, he kind of had free, free license of sorts for it. And I'm going to start off by saying uh, I I like both films for different reasons. Uh, do you remember when you first saw 2010? Yeah, I saw it in the theater. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, now, now 2000, now I was, uh, as I've covered on these shows before, uh, not that our audience might remember anything, but I was a sucker for anything space as a kid. So, uh, I desperately wanted to see 2001 and my parents were always like, no, 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 no. It's dumb. It's boring. You d- you're not going to be able to follow it. Uh, it's, and it's stupid, blah, blah, blah. We didn't like it. I'm like, no, no, no. I really want to see it. I want to see it. And, you know, I got the soundtrack with all the classical music and everything. And, and, uh, I watched it and they're like, okay. And they're saying, see, don't you want to turn this off? I'm like, no, no, no. And I'm following it. I loved it. I actually had a harder time understanding 2010 when I saw it because it involved so much politics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I did see it. I saw it in the theater and I loved that too, even though I didn't quite get all the minutia of what was going on. I just kind of got, okay, I know that there are Americans. I know that there's Russians and I'm getting every day. You know, if you could not grow up in the eighties without knowing without the Cold War being very big on your rate <laughs> because it was just shoved down your throat every second. Um, if you were, you know, it was like, oh, the Russians, the Russians are going to get you, the Russians are going to get you, and I'm sure that the uh, Soviets had the same thing happening with us. Mm-hmm. You know, the Americans are going to get you. Um, but um, so, But we didn't understand – but I didn't understand things about like naval blockades in Central America and stuff like that, which they go into. But uh, I could kind of follow what was going on. And I enjoyed this movie a lot when I saw it uh, back in 84 and uh, uh, not, but, but it's, you know, it's been kind of, it it took, it was very hard to reconcile my feelings because it is a very different movie than 2001 in ways in which I'm sure we're going to get into on the show here. Yeah, it it is. It it caught me when I saw it. I I think if I remember correctly, my dad took me to see it, or we went to see because my dad was a big fan of two thousand one. I've got uh, actually my buddy recently got me the soundtrack on vinyl. Uh, well, I used to I used to take that out of the library all the time <laughs> of two thousand one because you know it it had it had just those great classic uh, cues in it, and so we get to two thousand ten, uh, the year we made contact, and. I was jarred a little 
by uh, the difference in it because this one, if you would, they're both sci-fi. Though 2001's very much felt a lot more harder sci-fi than 2010. It, it still dabbles in it, but this one felt like it was a lot more mainstream than 2001. It, you, you, am I off on that, Scott? Or is this you know, the... and, and I'm going to tell you, so, and there's a few reasons for that. First of all, you got to remember in when they made 2001, that was the first time anybody had seen something like that. I mean, yes, mm-hmm. you had people dabbling with some um, more brainy sci-fi stuff, um, uh, such as, you know, uh, uh, the planet on the far, whatever, the journey to the far side of the sun or something right. like yep, that. Yep. <laughs> uh, a lot of German filmmakers were making stuff and those would make their way over here in edited form and stuff. And there's lots of stuff like that, but, to see something on that scale where, no, we're being serious, this is all scientifically accurate, this is a really cerebral movie, you had, you know, people who had been in Hollywood all their other, I think, what's, 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 what's the, what was uh, the, the Rock Hudson quote? He left the theater and said, would somebody mind telling me what the hell that was all about? <laughs> 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 was, you know, when you saw, like, the space stations and you saw all this and that, and th- it was the first time anybody had seen something like that. Well, since then, uh, we'd had like 15, 16 years of people building on that. Yeah. And they built on it two ways. You had very serious science fiction, like silent running and stuff like that. And then you had also uh, st- halfway between the two movies, Star Wars happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was it uh, that um, uh, Ebert said? He said like 2001 taught us that, you know uh, – that there is no sound in space, and Star Wars said yes, but there should be. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you want to talk about, you know, my God, it's full of stars. You can't, like, I mean, th- there's, like, tons of stars when you see space in this movie, which is not accurate. It was more accurate in the original to just have this blackness. So you don't need to establish, like, this is what weightlessness is like. This is what this is like. It's been covered. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we, so you can just focus on uh, the story. And what I think is interesting about this movie um, is that, first of all, anyone saying, I am going to do a follow up to a Kubrick movie <laughs> is on a fool's errand. Yes. I don't want to care if you're saying, you know, more paths of glory or son of strange love or anything. I don't care. <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't. Just don't mess with it. You know, you're just going to regret it. However, if you say I'm going to do a follow up to Arthur C. Clarke's story, Mm -hmm. it's fine. Yeah. And the book 2001, I wrote, which which I also am a huge fan of the book. By the way, anybody who doesn't understand 2001, the movie, just read the book. It's really the movie. It really is what it is. It's not that hard, guys. It really is. (laughs) (laughs) It is. Whatever you think that movie's about is probably you're probably right. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, like so, so you can just follow that story. And as a so he doesn't make a Kubrick film; he makes a Peter Hyams film based on an R.C. Clarke story. And Peter Hyams has messed with uh, science fiction before. In fact, he messed with. Jupiter's moons before with Outland. He messed with space exploration before with Capricorn One. Um, and as a, you know, Kubrick film, no, 2010 doesn't work, but it's not a Kubrick film. It's a Peter Hyams film. And as a Peter Hyams film, 2010 is fucking dynamite. <laughs> it's, it's really good. And and what it does is it it has the it has the best things about his movies. Uh, Peter Hyams has been a hit and miss director, but when he hits, the pacing is really good uh and there's really good interaction between people. Uh I will say one thing that this mo- there is one thing, it's a very big thing. I don't know if you want to get into this now, but sure, there's a very good thing that this film does much better mm-hmm. than 2001. Oh, yeah, we can get into it. Sure, go ahead. And it's because it's something that 2001 really didn't care about. 2001 was is, the, when you hear about complaints about the movie and people who can't wrap their heads around it, 
one of the big complaints you'll hear is that it's a very cold film, which is fair. Mm-hmm. It's about the wonders of new life and the and you're supposed to be awed by this, but you're supposed to be awed like a scientist is odd or like somebody who's just first discovering a world is odd. That's the way it, it, the level it works on. Now, who was Dave Bowman? Who was his astronaut buddy Poole? We don't really know. We yeah. see, you know, a very brief thing where the, where he calls his kid at the very beginning, and that's it. And that was really even that scene was more about the technology than it was about the interaction between uh, father to daughter. Right. We don't know because we Kubrick doesn't really care about that. He says like, no, we'll focus on that's not the uh, eye we're looking at through. So this movie, knowing that we've already kind of covered a lot of the stuff as we mentioned, or as I mentioned because I'm just babbling. Um, um, it really focuses on how people get along. And in fact, the story itself is, it hinges on that because it's about how the Soviets and the Americans are getting along and how they say, you know, they are actually feel now very far apart from the politics of their homeland. They, as far as they're concerned, they're just scientists in space trying to discover things. And so you get all this about how they get along with people. You have a bunch of stuff at the beginning about Haywood Floyd and how he relates to his wife and mm-hmm. his son. You get stuff later on where they talk talk with the other astronauts, both on their own team. There's lots of human interaction, lots of human drama. You get to know pretty much all of these people as people, even people who have almost no lines of dialogue. Yeah. As there is in one scene, you get to get the actual human emotion from these people. This is something that 2010 concerns itself very crucially with that 2001 doesn't. And it's something, so it's something that is handled much, much better this time around. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, Watching it again for here after not watching it for so long, um, you do get a lot more human interaction, human moments in here. I mean, you know, uh, Dr. Haywood, played by Roy, uh, he gets woken up first, and the the Russians, you know, you still have that tension even on board at first, and the Russians aren't being cooperative because they're following orders. And he's mm-hmm. like, he's like, guys, we're all scientists. We're like two years away from the planet. Who gives a rat's ass about borders? I want to know more about this damn monolith <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's floating out here. And then suddenly he, they kind of warm up to the idea, too, because, again, they were trying to reflect the Russian culture that was really portrayed in the 80s of how more militaristic, how much more, you know, follow the orders type they were. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got that all the way through to spies like us. Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, at, at first, but those crazy Americans finally warm up the Russians. But uh, you, I do like the human interaction. You mentioned it. There's, there is a great moment in here where there's, uh, I don't, there's like very little dialogue. It's, uh, it's a side character who's just, she's just one of the crew members, and the Russians, uh, they're in the Russian spaceship. And they've got to do this one very dangerous remo- maneuver, basically slingshot around Jupiter. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's going to be very dangerous. And you're right. When when Peter hits, he hits. And he builds up the tension for what they're doing. And you don't get a whole lot visually, but the way he builds up how drastic this is and how no one's ever done it before. I mean, he builds it up. And then to emphasize it, We've got our uh, we've got our Dr. Haywood in his little pod, and all of a sudden this female cosmonaut comes up, the the scientist who we've not really met anywhere since we saw her slightly, you know. She comes mm-hmm. in and taps on it, and she wants to be held because she's scared shitless as well about this. And she wants s- to be and and they seatbelt each other in because they have nothing to do. I mean, and he at this point has just gotten done. Uh, sometimes you'll hear like you know letters or transmissions or whatever he's sending to his wife. And he said, you know, everybody else can concern themselves because they're busy. 
I just have to sit here and wait for this to happen. And so you think, oh, he's not in his uh, in this boat all by himself. But then, no, you see, like, no, this other person's here. They're, this person's scared, too. You know, doesn't speak a word of English hardly. But, you know, just it, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing romantic about it or nothing, uh, you know, untoward. It's just, you know, fear, desperation, a need to be, you know, close to somebody else during this very terrifying moment. Because they don't, they don't want to necessarily die alone. So, I mean. Exactly. No, and there's nothing more human than that. Yeah. So, you know, Roy and, and the other two uh, U.S. folks on there is John Lithgow's uh, Walter Kurnow, who uh, he, he's kind of a side character, as well as uh, the Dr. R. Chandra, who is supposed to be a carryover from the first film as far as being the teacher of Hal, the uh, batshit crazy uh, computer. But uh, he's a different name than he was in the first movie, but apparently he's the same name that was in the book because yeah. they changed the name in the 2001 movie from the book. So in actual... Yeah. But they just but they put it back in the book. You know, a lot of this is just also the book. I mean, My God, It's Full of Stars isn't in the movie either. Right. <laughs> yeah. But it's repeated about three times before the opening credits come back. <laughs> in a very, very kind of odd voice, too. You're just like, wait, is this a horror film or something? What the fuck? <laughs> you know? Uh, but the Russian the Russian crew is great. The, the group of actors they have, including a familiar face who... I did not recognize. I don't know if it was the hair in the Russian outfit or what, but Helen Mirren played. Well, she's just a damn good actress as well. <laughs> <laughs> she is. She's just a damn good actress. And in here, I guarantee you, you go, which character was she? Because <laughs> if you did look in the credits, you, you would, it, knowing how she is now, and those who may be familiar with her later works will look at this and go, wait, that was Helen? <laughs> and she plays it. I didn't realize First, huh? according to like the trivia thing, it's how she got her SAG card because it was her. They, they said her first American film. I said really? <laughs> I was like, because I, I knew she was doing movies for like you know at least fifteen years. You know, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Age of Consent was like back in the sixties. You know, so you know, I was surprised. I was surprised. Like God, I guess it was all like British, like European film lensed films before then. That's true. <laughs> Because, yeah, she, she in here uh, plays uh, uh, Tanya Kerbuck, which is, if you spell the last name backwards and add a C, it's Kubrick, so it's a little nod to him. Uh, mm -hmm. And she ends up being kind of the the very stoic Russian scientist, even more so than the rest, uh, though she eventually kind of releases it going, yeah, you know what, we are just all scientists. Uh, a after she loses a crew member, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I loved her performance in this and the, the kind of dichotomy they had in here, because one of the things I did really enjoy as well is we you mentioned it, Scott, perfectly eighties, especially mid eighties, you're, you're neck deep in the cold war. They don't let you forget it. Portrayal of the other side was usually really coarse. And in here, even when we first meet the Russian scientists, they're portrayed, yeah, different than Americans, but I would, I would argue to say they are still portrayed different than Russians were portrayed at that time in other films. Would oh, you definitely. Compare this to Rocky IV, which, <laughs> yeah, which came out like the next year. Mm-hmm. You know, this that was, and that's pretty much what you saw. I mean, you didn't see, you saw the stoicism. You did not see a human face. I mean, even on Saturday morning cartoons, uh, Russians were not. The, it, it, the Soviets were just not because it was so hot. Everybody these days, and you'll see these things. All, all the eighties were so great. The eighties were so great. I every every time I see that, I just want to kick them in the balls. <laughs> These were not great guys. There was a lot of fear. There was a lot of jingoism. And I'm not saying that the Soviets were fantastic. Of course they weren't. But, you know, 
the way this drum was beaten to us, you know, combined with, you know, the AIDS crisis and the fear of nuclear war, it was not a great freaking time, guys. <laughs> And I, I'm very happy that even though we haven't gone to, to, you know, have manned things to Jupiter's moons or discovered aliens life, you know, one thing in these movies that is very dated is that this was a Cold War was still going on. And I'm yeah. happy that that's not the case. But, you know, the week's young, so. <laughs> <laughs> Give, yeah, you know, it's only it's only you know, uh, when we're recording this, it's only Wednesday. You know, yeah. it's a Wednesday evening. We got time yet before the weekend to get into a Cold War. Uh, <laughs> it, well, the fear was everywhere, and that's why I liked it. I got worried at first because, again, it had been years since I watched this, which is another reason why I wanted to do this series. And I'm watching it, and I'm like, wow. At first, when we very first see them, and like I said, there was that scene with the table where no one's giving up really any information because they were told by their government that they are only there to transport these guys to Discovery, and they don't, you know, give them just the basic info. Um, and I was like, oh, great, because I didn't remember a lot of the film. I'm like, oh, great, is this going to be the whole, you know, they're hard-nosed all the time? And then, but even in that scene, you get one guy already who just goes, starts sharing data, and then, yeah, within a very short amount of time, suddenly they're working together, uh, it's like they've got political tension that they're trying to ignore as their leaders uh, are, are giving them orders and things escalate on Earth because they've got this big fucking monolith in front of them that is um, just amazing, and then it disappears. Suddenly they find chlorophyll on, uh, was it uh, Io or uh, Europa? Uh, no, Europa. It was Europa. They find freaking in the... Ice, you know, and then Discovery, they find that still. It's like, you know, they've got all these wonders in front of them. It doesn't take too long for all of that political stuff that they've had drilled in their head kind of melt away because they're scientists and they're just like, holy crap, we're witnessing something fantastic. And Dave lets them know as well uh, a couple of times uh, <laughs> it's going to be uh, just wonderful. Um, and so I loved that aspect. And it, it, it is just a bit different than what you were used to seeing from films of that time when you had American and Russians. Uh, one of my favorite scenes in it is there's a scene as things escalated on Earth to where they're supposed to suddenly move to their different territories because uh, the Russian spaceship finally ends up docking with Discovery. And so their Discovery is considered a U.S. territory, and they're on Russian territory, which is the other ship. And there's a scene where there's two monitors next to each other. One's got the Russian representative, and one's got the U.S., and they're giving their orders at the exact same time. Yeah. And, and I don't know what it was about that scene, Scott, but for me, I'm just looking at that going... That just scene there where they're giving the same orders about it at the same time and, and they're right next to it. And like, that just, for me, spoke to me on a number of levels about especially the period of time this was made. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just loved how that scene came together and, and how each ship was considered territory, which as the film goes... Separated, you know? Yeah. Almost being... Their politics are after this... Uh, detente kind of they're being it's being forced on them uh there's this great quote and i was looking it up actually last minute or so mm. here because i wanted to make sure i got it correct uh from one of the uh astronauts um uh who walked on the moon actually uh edgar mitchell mm -hmm. and his quote is this uh, when he talked about what it's like being on the moon he said you develop an instant global consciousness a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world, and a compulsion to do something about it. From out there on the moon, international politics looks so petty. You want to grab a politician by the scruff of the neck and drag him a quarter of a million of the miles out and say, look at that, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I think that's where these people were at at the time. You know, they were saying, you know, now... Our world is small, mm -hmm. you know, so 
it, our world is now is now far away. our home is far away so our world is whatever is right in front of us and what we're trying to do and when they got these orders that was kind of a wake up that they're still being you know puppets kind of being pulled on these strings from several million miles away right and and a little bit of that uh conditioning does come back in cuz they they do kind of go on their other sides very reluctantly uh, but we learn later on that they end up having to still work together anyway to get the hell out of Dodge uh, yeah. because something wonderful is coming. And we get to see Dave again. And I don't know about you, Scott, but I still chuckle when I watch this film and you have the Dr. R. Chandra character go, well, I want to revive Hal. And I'm just like, dude, <laughs> no, no, you don't. <laughs> you, you, you. There, there's a famous, yeah. There's a thing, um, you know. I'm, and I mentioned Ebert before in uh, Ebert's review of this. He does. He was not a huge fan. Yeah, I think he gave it like two stars or something. And he wanted to. He said that during this moment in the movie, the show's called Spoiler Room, guys. So spoilers. Um, <laughs> he uh, uh, he wanted to plug his ears, but uh-huh. we find out why Hal went cuckoo. And it wasn't, and it wasn't for the reasons we thought. It wasn't that he felt threatened or did this. It was because he had two sets of orders that can, that canceled each other out. Mm-hmm. Because he being uh, actually given higher orders from the White House, right. and to keep things secret, and. That's and he was completely able to perform the mission on his own, and that's why he was he acted the way he did and saw the crew as expendable. <laughs> and and we when we find that out, we're like, oh, so we've and it is a ballsy move because for you know all these years we've thought that Hal was the bad guy, right? <laughs> we thought it was a robot. That an artificial intelligence that became too intelligent and went actually insane, and it wasn't. So, yeah, I thought that was an interesting uh, scene where you get that reveal of the orders because everybody's looking at Doctor Haywood at first, going, "Why'd you put that order in there?" So you're the reason. He's like, "No, I did." What the hell are you talking about? And then it's like, "Wait, the Department of Justice?" And they're just like. All the scientists in the room kind of do a head, um, of, of invisible head slap of sorts. They're just like, uh, typical upper management messing with technology they don't understand. Uh, yep. <laughs> you know, because uh, that that you know five astronauts died. <laughs> you know, right? Uh, yeah. and, and so you get that, uh, which is a great reveal, and. and Interesting, because after that, suddenly you look at Hal a bit differently. Uh, mm-hmm. Which I was surprised that Hal was not a bigger character in this movie. He's really not. He's very incidental. He is more of a, a, a side note than he is an actual a player in it. And, and they kind of tease you, too, because uh, early in the film, when we're introduced to this uh, Dr. Uh, Chandra, he's actually got another computer named Sal. Mm-hmm. So you almost think, oh, are we going to get Hal versus Sal? You know, my my brain suddenly jumped back to to ten year old Mark and going, ooh, we're going to have a Hal versus Sal, uh, who was voiced by uh, Candace Bergen uh, under a, a different. I didn't know it, which I didn't know until I started reading up on this. I'm like, oh, neat. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of why it sounded familiar, though. She used a pseudonym, but uh, you know, you don't get that, but you do get the introduction that Hal wasn't the only piece of technology out there i mean we're talking nine years since 2001 when in in the film timeline so of course it makes sense you know he's one of the world's leading scientists and everything one thing i do wish they had gone more into here is uh getting dr chandra there and it's played by bob balaban who's a great actor um you've seen him in for decades since trust me uh although it probably should have been played by an actor with some Indian heritage, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> with the with, with the last name, yeah, it w- would have. They don't get much more. <laughs> they just don't get much more, you know. Yeah, uh, Ivy League, but 
about Balaban. <laughs> but um, uh, but uh, but uh, he, but one thing I like this is that they mentioned, and pro- possibly because of what happened with Hal Nine Thousand on the original mission, is that they don't trust him. Right. And that there's lots of stuff, you know, where they have like, you know, this fail safe and everything like that, that it would Floyd is putting in for hell because he doesn't trust the, the computer and he doesn't trust uh, the doctor, the scientist. And like, I would have liked to them to build more on that distrust, which they really didn't do um, in this movie. So I'm, I always wonder, like, maybe if there was something cut out for time or something like that, because this is. This, they didn't really pay it off with any kind of suspense about this because I'm like I'm like this guy seems like the most amiable person, <laughs> you know, on, on board. <laughs> they, well, they, I think they had a lot of ground to try to cover. It feels like so. Yeah, I, I think he gets shortchanged because there are elements. You're right, hints of things you think they're going to really explore, but it. It, it kind of fizzles. I mean, there's the relationship between uh, John Lithgow's Walter Kernow character and uh, uh, Maxim. Uh, oh, I love, I loved that uh, subplot there. there. There's this little sub subplot where these two they they go together. Once they get to the discovery, they gotta send someone over. So of course Russia is gonna send one person over with the Americans. So you know, uh, and so it's Walter Kernow and this Maxim. Uh, character who's played fantastically by Elia Baskin. And there's a great relationship that develops there at the beginning when they go over to the ship of discovery and they're, you know, uh, Walter is just freaking the fuck out because he's never done a spacewalk. And now he's doing basically a, he's tethered to one guy and a booster rocket. (laughs) And we've got to try to hit the discovery. Uh, so he's freaking out, and Maxim's calm and calms him down. But there's this great friendship, this subplot that builds. And then, uh, yes, spoiler room, folks, uh, something happens to Maxim. And in the trivia I was reading, they point out how uh, Kurnow is wearing Maxim's hat from mm-hmm. then on out after Maxim Pat, uh, gets sucked, you know, gets uh, an, uh, basically vaped or whatever, vaporized by the uh, monolith um, or sucked in. And, yeah, but it it feels like there was something a little missing there with it. Like, they could have explored a little more there, too, and they didn't. Because... Yeah. I mean, I liked what they did build, Mm -hmm. as I said. But, yeah, I think that they could have done a lot more. I think that basically a lot of the stuff with any of the other side characters, they kind of had to focus on uh, Roy Scheider's character and uh, Helen Mirren's as the two kind of de facto mission leads you know and uh so we missed uh some with those some with uh, uh uh lithgow and baskin and we missed uh, some with uh valavan as well right uh, yeah. let's ring if we're gonna name all the, the actors <laughs> <laughs> you you can see though elements there to where they could have added more that would have kept still the story interesting you know well, I, think, I think i think they could i think this film could have you know, one of the things about the movie is that it does get very muddled uh, in the second half, I think, mm-hmm. movie. Uh, but I think that it could have still survived another 10 minutes of character development uh, between those side, side characters. Yeah, you know? I, I think so, too, because of the talent you have there as well. You would you wanted to see more of some of these characters, but you don't because there is one character in here from the first one that was so prevalent. And in here... We don't get a whole lot of in most of the film. I mean, we do get the big version of it, which disappears suddenly. But as we get to the climax of the film of uh, things happening, they get to see Dave again, which, of course, freaks everyone out because they think he's dead. But no, he's one with the monolith. And there's something happening on Jupiter. Scott, what's happening on Jupiter? Uh, Well, I mean, there's... uh... There's a, they start out with chlorophyll and they start realizing there's something down there in one of the craters. And uh, then you see a very large black spot on Jupiter that they want them to investigate. They, the black spot keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And they realize the reason it's a black spot is those are all monoliths. <laughs> Which uh, 
it's something I completely forgot about mm-hmm. uh, in the movie because I haven't seen it in a couple decades. And I mean, I almost shit myself. <laughs> 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 like, oh. <laughs> That's hardcore, yeah. <laughs> Here are these monoliths that were, you know, Kubrick built up in the film as its own character and kind of a scary character, even though it was also one that enlightened the apes. At the same time, it was like, it's still scary as hell, the sound and everything. And now you have thousands of them and more of them appearing every minute, apparently consuming Jupiter. And that's where the Russians and the uh, U.S. decide... Oh, you know what? Screw our political factions. We want to live. And so they come up with this way of uh, using the Discovery as a booster rocket, which I'm sure the whole audience, including myself, makes you a little nervous because by then Hal is awoke and you're like, how's Hal going to take this? (laughs) But he rolls with it. Uh, Well, they keep you guessing towards the end because they want, uh, because even after getting the. all the explanation, you know, and saying, oh, it's not my fault. It's not this thing. What do they want? You know, they have the meeting about it. And, you know, uh, Dr. Chandra is, is the one person who looks at Hal and sees a life form. Right. Yeah, he is an artificial intelligence, but he is a life form. He can think. Mm-hmm. And um, so he's the one person who's the advocate for Hal. And what do the pe- other people, even after all of this, want to do? They say, oh, you got to lie to Hal. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, uh, you remember yeah. what happened last time, right? <laughs> you know, and so, you know, it which means like, ah, so, yeah, thanks for underlining that you're the reason why this whole thing screwed up. <laughs> you know, but, yeah. You know, because it was the same thinking. Yeah. And um, so he, you know, there's this very tense stuff at the end where, He's, you know, wondering, like, where Hal's starting to see, like, hey, this, like, during the countdown to get out of there. Right. And he's like, he said, Hal's like, you know, I'm, I'm starting to see uh, some really strange activity here. Wouldn't this be better if we just, you know, aborted the countdown <laughs> and I could, so we can stick around and take a look at this? No, no, no. And he's like, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> and it's not really until uh, Dr. Chandra says, oh, screw it, uh, mm-hmm. and was is levels with him and says, look, this is what's going to happen. And, you know, Hal has that great moment, uh, echoing a moment from uh, the beginning with the Sal character, because he has to disconnect Sal momentarily. Mm-hmm. And Sal asks, you know, will I dream? And, you know, and uh, Hal asks that. And I think there's a really great moment between the two there, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, when he realizes that, oh, no, this makes sense. I do. He's very logical. So he says, no, this makes sense. I do. You have to sacrifice me in order to survive. Right. He figures it out. So and he figures it out and he's he accepts it in a very, really interesting moment, I think so. Yeah. Well, I, I think Hal gets a little help from Dave, because Dave is ghosting around. He's like, woohoo! Don't... He's like, boo! He's like, yeah, ha ha! I got you anyway. <laughs> boo, Hal! <laughs> He's like, boo! He's like, oh, hey, Hal, how are you, you doing? Open up the pod bay doors for me now, get you bitch! <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, he shows up, and, and you, you get the impression that, you know, there's this interesting relationship now that's carried over from the events after 2001 between Hal and Dave um especially with Hal even though he was deactivated being out there for so long and so I think there was maybe a little assist from Dave but yeah Hal works it out logically this time going oh okay yeah you know what I'm I'm the robot you're the humans you guys got to survive I I don't I don't like this, but at the same time, yeah, it it makes logical sense. Meanwhile, it was a very, just very Spock moment where it was <laughs> like, no, you know, it's okay to sacrifice me so that everybody else can live. I understand it. It's the only way this can get done. So, 
I think that's really all it was. I think it was just that yeah. he was. I don't think it's that he saw himself as less. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think that on some level, Hal appreciated that Chandra saw them as equals. He appreciated the honesty, actually. And he even offered to stay behind. And he's right. like, no, no, there's there's no reason for you to stay behind. Um, and, um, you know, and uh, I think so I think it was just a matter of, you know, not being necessarily happy about the situation, but understanding and, mm-hmm. you know, coming to like, you know, quiet resignation about it. And and Dave needed Hal as well to communicate a message because, as you can tell, folks, we're getting we're getting near the uh, end of the film here, and yeah, Jupiter's getting sucked in by a whole bunch of monoliths, which is kind of creepy. And suddenly, there's this message we come to find out after the monoliths hit uh, a peak. Uh, Jupiter is turned into a sun, and all of its moons start to become possible planets. And the message sent out. Obviously, probably from the monolith, I believe it's implied, or through Dave, through Mm -hmm. Hal, is that, hey, this is going to happen. It's wonderful. We're going to give you this. Oh, yeah. Stay the fuck off Europa. Yeah. (laughs) All these worlds are yours, except Europa. Attempt no landing there. Yeah, we we um, get one. (laughs) You know? And, uh... Just basically saying, because that's going to be the next part of evolution. That's what the monolith is, folks. Is it's that it's these things that the architects of the universe send out to jumpstart evolution mm-hmm. on various worlds, and that's what happened here. The monolith showed up; people started popping up. It showed up again; people started using tools. and then it pops up uh, around jupiter because hey this moon looks really good and actually they do say that europe uh, back especially around the time that this was made europa was seen as a uh possible uh place where life could eventually evolve one day right because of the uh because of the sheer volume of ice or whatnot if you got just the right conditions with it europa was the best candidate to possibly terraform to be a livable planet because it's so huge too um yeah and so yeah so i don't i didn't remember that when i was younger because you know obviously when i was fucking 10 and 9 you know you didn't really pay attention to that near the end you're just like holy crap jupiter became a sun um and then the planets and then you get that, yeah, at the end, the monolith is sitting on Europa, uh, which has a whole bunch of atmosphere and stuff to it. Uh, and, yeah, it's, uh, it implies, you know, hey, there's this, this still goes on. This, there's still more to be uh, evolved to. There's still more levels to go. Uh, and I guess I was reading up on it. They had thought of actually doing two more sequ- film versions of uh, the other Arthur C. Clarke films, uh, books, because he did, like, two other books. Yeah, and... it was 2061 and 3001, yeah. which I did not read. I, I actually got halfway through 2010, the book, and then I lost the book. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't find the book, so I was like, yeah. So that's, that's, I've, I've read one and a half of these books. <laughs> well, well. A little bit of a spoiler for the book, because I was reading up trivia on it. I guess there's an a epilogue of sorts that's set in, prepare yourself, folks, 20,001 A.D., where apparently there's uh, evolved humans noids of sorts with, like, uh, tentacle-like appendages for arms. And it sounded just wild uh, <laughs> that it had evolved because the monolith was there. And it had sparked a, another evolution. But, um, yeah, it, you know, and by the end of it, they're both good films. In this one, though, is definitely you could see where it was a little bit more open to the mainstream. But there's still, I still think you still get those heavy themes in here that you got in 2001, uh, you know, a little further exploration. At, and it was you know. so topical at the time, too, because, you know, this is a time when, you know, we were still getting data from the Voyager probe. Mm-hmm. And everything when this was being written and then when the film was being made. And um, at one point in the 80s, I can't remember if it was before this movie or not, 
for most of our lives, we li- we agree we lived with the knowledge of nine planets. Yeah, we had assumed there might be more, but we didn't know. And it was only around sometime in the eighties when we started getting all this data about, like, hey, we discovered more planets. Right. You know, uh, past our system, you know, and we've dis- we're discovering more planets. And I was like somebody who read like Omni and Discover, and you know, <laughs> I didn't get it all. You know, I was a kid, but but I got enough, you know, and I could certainly see stuff from the pictures and everything. So I was like, and I kept going into school and thinking, like, why isn't this like the top story on the news every night? (laughs) That we found more planets. (laughs) Like to me, like that was so much bigger than anything that was happening with the economy or with. But, you know, that's because, I don't know, I guess it was just like my, you know, my childlike brain wondered, like, just in wonder at all these worlds that were out there. Like, guys, we are literally discovering that there are more worlds and the universe really might be as vast as we imagine. Right. Um, Yeah, and it's not top story on the news and I couldn't figure out why. And then I'd go into my private school who told me that believing in aliens was evil (laughs) (laughs) and you're like all right i got a capital e for you then because i am not giving i was like well well, then you know then i guess i'm evil because (laughs) because i'm like (laughs) i I told i told i and i told i think i my words to them was that was that i think if you think we're the only people god put here then you don't think god has much imagination (laughs) (laughs) oh that i'm sure rose a couple eyebrows (laughs) (laughs) oh really and suddenly they start scribbling notes down oh (laughs) Oh, yeah like you're they're probably calling my folks and and again like you told them what you think again didn't you (laughs) guys you spoke your mind didn't you didn't you (laughs) <laughs> but anyway, but anyway, yeah, no, but like you know, but anyway, to, I'm getting off the point. I'm no, sorry. It, no, it's but, you know, this was like you know around the time when we're still discovering all these new things about that, and, you know, where uh, all of this data was coming in. I mean, remember all of this, you know, with the Hubble wasn't even out there yet. No, when this happened, you know, guys, this is a completely different age of scientific exploration. You know, when we were really just scraping the surface. Yeah, the, and um, so the, all of this was the, very topical for the time, and um, I don't know. I think there's still quite a lot of wonder in it and everything. So it's great. There is. It really captures the wonder of space because I remember, especially with a Jupiter, and that's why I was kind of captivated with it was because uh, the Voyager probe actually passed Jupiter on my birthday, in fact, uh, or around my birthday. It was uh, July 9th, 1979. I was four at the time, didn't know much. But the data it sent back, we're only talking five years out from that, and it was getting tons of images. And, yeah, I remember uh, even in in elementary school that uh, early talk when we would explore the planets, Europa was brought up a lot (laughs) because there's this big, huge moon around Jupiter. It's like, holy there's all these moons around Jupiter. Holy crap! And, you know, the, the, the scientists were still poring over what was being sent back. And, yeah, when we were studying the planets and that, it was still nine planets, but it was also, well, Jupiter has this many moons and there's this really large one that's, you know, could possibly support life. And then you get this theme again in 2010 uh, in this 1984 film, and you're just like, wow, that, we were just talking about that in school, <laughs> you know? You, you kind of have this real world connection because even though this one, as I equated as the more mainstream type film, uh, it's still got the heavy thoughts and it still has a good chunk of it, you know, grounded in in science, um, in, in many ways as far as what types of you know the moons and how they looked in that, uh, and so you get a little bit, I think, a better mixture that that makes it a little more accessible to your widescreen audience versus sitting that same audience down to watch 2001 the casual fans and they'll be just like um <laughs> yeah and it's a 
even as somebody who loves it, I can I can tell you that it's a really hard film to sit through simply because of the rhythm of the movie there's lots of moments of silence and lots of moments where there's nothing but say like rhythmic deep breathing and stuff like that so you're like okay <laughs> and, and you, gotta, you know keep the red bull handy <laughs> whereas, <laughs> whereas, it's a wonderful movie and it's a really good book too <laughs> and whereas 2010 clips along a lot faster mm-hmm. uh it, it, yeah I, f- I like the pacing of this film overall. It, you're right, it, it gets a little muddled, but still, oh, this film still moves fairly quick, especially compared to the first one. Um, yeah. It, it moves nicely. You, you're not looking at the runtime because uh, there's enough there to keep you interested, and everybody's just waiting. I think the big thing, if anyone who had seen 2001, when they're watching 2010, they're just waiting for Hal to go off the rail. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're just waiting for a Saturn V moment, you know. Uh, oh, <laughs> Every day, you know, like, us, that he's going to start singing Daisy and start you know, lusting after Helen Mirren. Or <laughs> <laughs> I saw you in Caligula. <laughs> I know what you could do, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think this is a solid sci-fi film. Um, I think if you may have found 2001 a bit uh, tough to watch, I think this one's definitely easier to watch. You, you got great talent in here. It's it's really a solid film, and I, th- I think it kind of just gets lost a little bit, especially in the mid-'80s with the sci-fi craze, because um, as far as action goes, there's there's tense moments in that, but it's you, you don't get no pew-pew. In this way, no, it's not that type of movie. It's uh, you know, and they and they try to they give you a little bit, and just that they, as I said, that there's like a, t- a huge star field in space, yeah. and that there, you know, the spaceships do you, you hear, you know, rockets ignite, and you hear whoosh every now and then, but it's not a, really about the whoosh. <laughs> they just kind of give the whoosh as kind of like a concession, like okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when they're doing the slingshot around Jupiter and they've got the the classic burning uh sound of reentry. Uh <laughs> though they were bouncing off the orbit, so I guess there was maybe a little atmo, but uh yeah, they they give you a little more noise in this one than uh the first one. Uh but overall I, I think it's a solid film. It's a good follow up and they make it their own. They don't try to continue kubrick because yeah good luck with that (laughs) you know i mean mike flanagan with dr sleep he wasn't even trying to really you know uh, of course the shining was a little bit easier to to probably replicate some of those scenes but even him he was still making his own film he wasn't trying to make another kubrick film because that's the thing you know it's like you know if you're if you're doing a a a sequel to a kubrick film you're on a a fool's errand so yeah hyams is doing uh a sequel to a Clark film and he's making his own movie. I think that, and I haven't seen Dr. Sleep yet, mm-hmm. but, um, I think Flanagan was, uh, making a sequel to King's novel. Yes. And was doing his own movie. He <laughs> threw, he, yeah. It was kind of a, a hybrid between King's novel and the movie in such a way. And, and he does it so well in that, but I like Flanagan in general, uh, but, uh, you know, it, with this film too, they, they, yeah, they make it their own. You, you don't, it doesn't, disrespect Kubrick's film at all but it definitely is like 2010's like no we're just we're our own thing here man <laughs> we're, just, we're just we're just flowing man uh, so yeah I think we'll wrap it up uh, would you recommend 2010 to uh, anyone or anyone in particular uh, Scotty D yeah as I said um, you know it that the politics can sometimes uh, catch you a bit off guard, but I think that if you if you dilute it down to the essentials, you know, and don't get too intimidated by either the science or the politics, you realize that it's a, a thing about discovery, about exploration, and about um, human interaction. Uh, that I think that, yeah, actually, I think it's a very good movie, and I think it's probably one of Peter Hyams' best films, mm-hmm. actually. Oh, and I think that this is a this was a period of time in which he was making a lot of really interesting movies. 
<laughs> uh, he was doing, you know, he was doing this, and then he uh, uh, he did Outland before, which I think is a great like space western. It's basically high noon in space. Mm. And um, the, the couple of years later, he would actually do probably one of the better buddy cop movies, Running Scared. He did didn't do like a lot of you know cerebral movies. This is probably the most cerebral movie he did, but I think that this is really one of his best. I think that he was, this is him at his peak. Um, he was a guy who handled pretty much everything. You know, this is a film. He wrote the screenplay for it. He produced it. He directed it. And like most of his films, he was also the cinematographer. on. Yeah. That surprised so, me actually. Yeah, Peter Heimler almost always worked as his own cinematographer on films mm -hmm. and he could do it because he knew what the hell he was doing. And, uh, I think this is really one of his best films. I don't compare it to the Cooper film. Uh, you know, just watch it as its own animal, and I think it's a very good movie. And if you're wondering why Discovery looked a little different, well, Stanley Kubrick being Stanley Kubrick burned and salted the earth behind him when he was done with 2001. And all those wonderful, beautiful models and sets were, were razzed, were completely destroyed. Um <laughs> Shit showing up on Space 1999, basically. Well, yeah, with with the pieces put together, and then you get Space 1999. Poof. Um, but just for you tech heads out there, before we close up here, it is reported that to stay in communication with Arthur Arthur C. Clarke, so he could make sure he was getting things right or get approval, good old Peter and Arthur had email in eighty three eighty four, which is was not for public consumption but they actually had email connection which yeah it was it was archaic back then by today's standards but that's pretty cool that you get a film as part of a series that is big on scientific discovery and technology and that and even behind the scenes it was reflected in some of the production that they did uh, behind the scenes. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. You know, that that's interesting. You bring that up because, you know, of course, uh, Clark and Kubrick worked together on the original, uh, film. And, you know, basically they, he wrote the book at the same time the movie was being developed. And there was a comment. There's a, there's like a little extra on the Blu-ray and which is like basically the old 1984 EPK. Uh, and they d discussed this. And Arthur C. Clarke has a great quote. He says, "He says yes." And so he would. I would get questions, and I would feedback things, and I would get send him questions. He says, "I actually think this is probably the best way to uh, work with um, a Hollywood director is if you don't have to actually look at each other." <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we will wrap it up for tonight. Uh, that's, that's great. <laughs> Well, thank you, Scotty D. I know we had some tech uh, issues uh, jumping off, but I'm glad we got this to work out. Yeah, technology. There you go, folks. And yeah. now this is the part of the film. Well, part of the show, excuse me. And now this is part of the show where I give my uh, crew member a license to shill. I know you still got stuff sitting out there because nothing goes away on the Internet, Scott. But what you got uh, to shill, if anything? It's just sitting there, but it's it's a uh, but you yeah you can read my old stuff at moviocrity dot com, and you can check out my old web series moviocrity on uh, YouTube and uh, Vimeo is actually where you can get all of the episodes of moviocrity. So look that up on Vimeo dot com slash channels slash moviocrity. But uh, otherwise, I don't know. Find me on Facebook or something. You know. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, there you have it, folks. 2010. Yes, it was connected to Footloose uh, by way of John Lithgow. And our next film that we are going to talk about on the next episode for our 52 Degrees KB is White Knights. Yes, Google it, folks. Uh, <laughs> it's not what you think. Uh, and, yeah, that's going to be an interesting discussion. And we will tell you uh, next time how that film is connected to 2010. So thank you so much for joining us on this journey, folks. And now we'll just say uh, good night, all you stars out there. Good night. 
Hey, all my friends out there looking for more spoiler room goodness, then why don't you check out our brand new Patreon page, patreon.com slash specialmarkproductions, where you can get access to exclusive spoiler room episodes and a whole lot more. You can also find us on Facebook groups at SMPRD and on to Twitter at Special Mark Pro. Let your voice be heard and let us know what you would like to see in the spoiler room, as well as just how we're doing.